Welcome everyone to the next installment of our look at how Indeed has been navigating the global impact of COVID-19. Uh, today is April 6th, we're on day 34 of our global work from home. But our involvement with this crisis goes back to late January, and we know that thousands of businesses around the world are facing the same challenges that we've been through and thought it might be helpful to share some of our experiences and uh, what we've learned along the way. So today we're speaking with Kelly Goolsby, who is our program manager for Risk at Indeed. And let's just start off with a, a quick check in of how are you doing today? I'm doing well. It's Monday. The sun is shining and uh, all, all is good. That's great to hear. Um, let's uh, start a little bit with, you know, what does a program manager for Risk do at Indeed? What were you doing right before things started to unfold for us at the beginning of January? So program manager, uh, the program manage uh, office that I'm in is that we're building large cross-functional enterprise level um, initiatives for Indeed. And so specifically, I was looking at business resiliency, which includes crisis management, business continuity, incident response. And so that enables the business to quickly uh, identify risk and escalate them to the right channels so that leadership can quickly respond. And what were some of the kinds of things that your team was working on responding to before um, COVID-19 broke? Instead of working on like very specific plans with like tons and tons of checklists, uh, my approach is really to build a, um, a framework that can help leadership resolve crises, everything from perhaps like technology issues all the way to maybe a natural disaster that would impact some of our facilities. And so that framework really relies on having the right teams, um, like senior leadership teams, all the way to regional crisis management teams that can respond to an issue in their region um, timely and then having the right tools to do so. So that's really what I was focused on and uh, we'll continue to do so once once we get through this. So this um, issue started becoming that, you know, international news in, in late January with the outbreak in the um, Hubei uh, province of China. We had employees starting to ask questions. Obviously we start probably started thinking about how this might impact us. And then in the first week of February, um, we had the first incident of uh, a family member of an employee of Indeed in our Singapore office learning that they had been potentially exposed. And so when did your team get involved in this and, and what was the sort of first set of steps that were taken immediately? So I got involved quickly after the decision was made to ask the Singapore office um, to work from home. I think it was like a Friday morning. And what we did after after learning that was there were a lot there were a lot of things to focus on. So we had to focus on communications, uh, making sure that uh, you know, making sure that we were communicating with our employees, with potential, you know, being prepared for external communications. Another thing that we had to do was take a quick look at what other employees had visited the Singapore office during that time frame, so that if we needed to uh, see if they perhaps had gone to another Indeed office that we were able to identify that and take appropriate steps. So those were some of the initial like, key actions that we took. Um, finally, I would say get, making sure that the crisis management team was set up. And so that had already organically formed, but making sure you have the right people in the room. So it's not, although this is a health issue, that it's not just for example, HR in the room, that you have communications in the room, you have people from technology in the room and operations that can can make expedited decisions. And was that particular piece part of your playbook that should something arise, we were going to put together this team? Because it, it seemed like one day we were talking about something and then the team was meeting three times a day the next day and it was just up and running. <laughs> Yes. And, you know, that's really thanks to to Paul. Um, he, he got these people initially in the room. But yes, that would be part of my playbook is that these people already know that they would be in these roles before a crisis happens and receive training so that you're able to quickly form. You know what to do, you know what tools you're going to use, you know how you're going to communicate. But yeah, that's that's part of the playbook. So starting with that first uh, potential exposure in Singapore, can you just walk a little bit through, you know, what did your team do to uh, adapt to just the speed 
of change because you know we we saw looking at that singapore office how many people had visited other offices and then office by office as things spread literally day by day um there were you know new pieces of information coming up we had to react we had to make decisions we had to 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 share those decisions with the company how how did you sort of navigate through those first few weeks well we Fortunately, do have a global company, and we are you know able to rely on the partners um, in the Asia offices to help us do that. Whether it be uh, HR business partners um, in in Sydney or even our comms people as well, that could help take take actions overnight. So we would meet during the day and figure out what our next steps needed to be, and. To the extent we needed calls to certain employees that were outside of that time zone, we were able to deliver those tasks to people on the other side of the world that were able to to complete those calls and get that information. It was a 24 hour really cycle of, of what we were able to do. So we had approximately four weeks of, of looking at the, the potential spread from office to office and making individual decisions to close down individual offices. And then on March 4th, we made the decision to just overnight move the entire company of 10,000 people to work from home. From, from your team's perspective, what changed when we moved from talking about travel restrictions and targeted office closures to just saying everyone is going to work from home starting tonight? Well, you have to, when that happens, so many decisions have to get made and so many things that we've never really practiced before. So fortunately, when we did have to temporarily um, close the uh, Dublin and the Sydney and the Singapore offices, we actually had a couple of days of data that we could look back and see how those offices performed and what questions came up when they had to work from home. So we were able to go ahead during that time period um, leading up to the, the decision for everyone to work from home, we were able to really focus our efforts and understanding what, what gaps did we have, what gaps, how we were able to close those, and start making plans to the extent you know other offices would have to close, what, how we could work around that. So it really, we, it didn't really slow down for us. In fact, we really did speed up the planning leading up to the to everyone working from home, so that you know we could we could try to do that as as easily as possible. Um, even so, there are always going to be things that you didn't think about that you have to you have to spin up new processes, new new ways of doing things pretty quickly. So uh, Paul Wolf, who you mentioned before, uh, Indeed's SVP of HR, Paul and I had a conversation about this on Friday. And one of the things for both of us was that to some degree, um, that decision and starting the next day when everyone was home, there was actually a, a kind of collective sigh of relief because we went from really worrying about what were we gonna do to protect the health and safety of our employees and their families and their communities to, okay, we've actually done everything we can now. And while it introduced new complexities, we actually felt like um, we had just eliminated one of the big, one of the big risks. And so from, from the risk perspective, one question is, um, what if any new risks in moving to an environment where 10,000 people are working from home, did your team have to then start to think about and put together a playbook. My guess is this wasn't on the list of things that we had really planned for, um, which is probably why your, your planning to plan was, was better than trying to anticipate everything that might happen. But what changes from a risk perspective when suddenly everyone's working from home? So there's a couple of things that you have to, to think about. One is uh, cybersecurity. So if people are working from home, are they doing that using safe tools? Um, because we, un we understand that when there are crises, this is not just unique to Indeed, when there are crises, there is enhanced risk uh, for, for that, for, for fraudulent actions, for um, hacking and phishing. So that's, that's something that we had to make sure the IT security team was on guard and, and you know, ready to go. Um, there's also a risk of absenteeism. Um, because if you have people at home, either you know, they might be happy to care for someone else um, once the schools were closed and people weren't able to actually like, you know, they're, they're now having to homeschool their, their children as well as work. And so what does that do for, for the core work and answering those questions and getting ahead of it and working with leadership um, on creating guidelines on how to do that? So the risk did change. 
it did change, but it was, it was more of like just being sure that we could continue to work, that our business could continue to operate. So what has um, changed for you personally in the working from home in terms of your, your day to day, but also your interactions with your team and with all the people who you have to partner with in this work? Probably just like everybody else, lots of Zoom calls, um, lots of uh, lawnmower, like there's a, you know, lots of strange noises that are around all the time that you can't control and that's okay. Yeah, I, it's, it was actually a pretty easy transition. Um, I have been pleasantly surprised how resilient I feel like people have become. Um, the culture, I think, really did, that was the culture and indeed while we were working together and it really did transcend to working from home. I really experienced that collaborative effort, uh, people really rising to the challenge, whether it be creating um, guidelines for parents at home or, you know, fun games or social media channels or, you know, show me pictures of your dogs. It's just, it really was, it's a very resilient culture and I appreciate that. What helped you prepare for something like this? Because this is clearly something that's not, not only has indeed not been through this, but no one has been through something quite like what's going on right now. Well, I have had a lot of experience working in dynamic, fast paced um, situations where you don't always have all the information that you want. And for me, what's worked is staying calm, understanding what's in front of us, what decisions need to be made, what kind of data do we need, and just methodically helping the team go through the decisions um, and not having tons of time to spend on decision making and just just moving us forward one step at a time. And even, even then though, this was, you're right, this is something I've never experienced, never planned for, no one else on the team had, but um, we just knew that we had to get through it. So now that we've, uh, not that we've really had a chance to breathe, but that we've had a little bit of distance from, from some of the early stuff, is there anything looking back, um, and I'm sure there will be hundreds of post-mortems that we're gonna do through this process, anything that if, if you, today could talk to, to Kelly, February 7th, you know, anything that you would do differently, any advice, anything that you might have approached with a, with a different perspective? Yes, like you said, there, there's going to be tons of changes as a result of this. We actually did pause early on and we did a quick retrospective, actually the, uh, the second week of February on the crisis team. We took a moment, it was actually like about two hours, and sat down and methodically worked through, okay, what, what didn't work, what did work. Uh, as a result, uh, we did some um, changes to uh, communications. We got a bit more organized with how we were tracking information. Um, so we did do that. I expect it will happen again. Um, other than that, really, you the planning piece is so important. Um, not you know, waiting until a decision is obvious to make that decision is too late. And so being able to plan when the sun is shining and get data that you know that you're gonna need in a certain situation and, and having reports ready to go so that you can, uh, you can make decisions based on, on real data is, is something that I would love for us to get better at. So, um, you know, at the start, you talked about the fact that every business right now is having to deal with how do we operate uh, in an environment like this. And we were pretty early on in making some of these decisions. So some companies now, there are still, uh, at least as of this weekend, eight states that don't have official uh, stay-at-home orders. So there are companies that still haven't made that transition that are going to. What advice would you have for them that obviously they can't go back and do a year of planning and preparing for this if you were just finding out today that this is something that your company might be facing? What's, what are some of the practical things that you would, you would advise? I would give them three ideas. One, develop your, your, your guidelines early. What, what, is, what is your approach going to be? For us, that was the health and safety of our employees and our community. That will help you make decisions later on when they get tricky. So you can always point back to that, whatever it may be. Two, overly communicate. The way and methods that you would communicate when you are not into a crisis, or not in a crisis, they don't work when you're in a crisis. You need to up that. You need to provide more information, understanding that you may not always have all the information, but providing places for your employees to go, whether that be FAQs or uh, enhanced Q and A's with executives, so that employees feel like they're getting the 
like answers to their questions and that their leaders are thinking about questions are topics that may come up. And then finally, making sure you have a cross-functional team that is ready to go, that is also, um, I would say, at a, at a certain seniority level so that they can make decisions and execute those decisions pretty quickly. There's been a lot of talk about how changing the way that we work as a, as a result of this and, and certainly things that are completely out of the realm of what you might expect cropping up. Um, what do you think will change coming out of this when we get to whatever the other side of this looks like when, when people start going back to, to work? Um, what, what do you think will change at Indeed and what do you think might change for other companies in terms of what we've learned from this experience? Well, I, I think the, uh, the obvious one is that we are able to work from home. Um, I think that is going to change the nature of work. I think it's, it's pretty exciting um, given if, if, we, if we take this reality that we can work from home, we have the tools to work from home, then as companies are making decisions about new hires, for example, you might not be limited to um, a pool of candidates just in your town. You know, you, you're able to open that up and actually get the expertise that you really need. Um, and, you know, I know realize working from home is not for everyone, but I, I think it was it was it was actually um, kind of when everyone's on equal footing and we all have to do this together, you really do learn the other side of it. So I also think for people that are returning to the office that are not working from home, hopefully we'll have a bit more empathy uh, for people that are working from home. Great. Well, um, thank you so much for your time, Kelly. And, you know, one of the things about your role, there's a, a, a lot of people who do jobs where um, when nothing is going wrong, you might not appreciate what that role is. And this is one of those things where, uh, you know, I think you were you were one of the folks early on who who kind of came to me and Dave and said, this is something that we need to be ready for. We're not doing any of it. And you put together a series of presentations and arguments for what we should do and the resources that were necessary. And um, I, I can just say my most sincere thanks for having led all that and, and helped because I'm I'm 100 percent confident that we would not have been able to navigate this as um, with as, as much grace um, as as we have. And honestly, with with as little disruption, it's really been amazing to me how every single team has come together and um, and a big part of it you did mention the culture that the company as a whole has just come together around this but um, we we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation right now if you had not done all the work that you've done over the last year so I want to just thank you so much for everything you've done to get us here today you're welcome and thanks for taking the time